all joined us today um, for the second of the Venus Flytrap series. We have a great number of people on the call today, and I know we have a few more coming on now. I got a few emails saying that folks are signing in and, and joining on, so thank you. There will be a video sent out afterwards, so you guys will be able to see the slides and hear from Leslie and Andy afterwards as well. I'm going to turn it over to Julie Moore, who is with Southern Conservation Partners, and she will get us rolling on the second of the Venus Flytrap series. Thanks, Julie. Thank you, Tara. I know you have to make this all work for us, which I appreciate. I'm Julie Moore. I'm a retired uh, endangered species biologist. I worked in North Carolina for many years with the North Carolina Natural Heritage Program. And I've worked with a, bunch, uh, a variety of land trusts across the South. Uh, fire dependent ecosystems are my, one of my specialties. And the Venus flytrap is one of my favorite species to deal with. And what's happening in North Carolina today, we really realize how many of these populations of this uh, unusual uh, plant we're really losing today. And my particular interest is trying to encourage the private sector to manage their flytraps but also to uh, provide them with technical help if they need it. We're recognizing people as champions, either landowners or people who are actually managers of property. And uh, the managers are what uh, really counts on public lands to do the management that's necessary to keep the fly traps in place. Our speaker, one of our speakers today, is having trouble connecting because he's so such a remote location. So we're gonna start with Leslie Stark today. And Leslie is the head of the North Carolina Plant Conservation Program. And it's a very interesting program that she can give us some background on, as well as talking about the management that they're doing on one of their preserves uh, in Eastern North Carolina that really has a marvelous Venus flytrap population. Leslie, why don't you get us started? Sure, thanks. I'm going to have Tara um, share my slides for me, and so I'll work with her to advance through them. Like Julie said, I work for the Plant Conservation Program. We are a state agency out of the North Carolina Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services. We're the part of the state government that lists state listed plant species, and we have a variety of uh, regulatory and conservation programs that we do for those species to try and keep North Carolina's native flora on landscape. Um, okay, there we go, great, thank you. If you'll go to the next slide, please. So among um, many duties, our program owns and manages 26 currently dedicated nature preserves across North Carolina. And these are for the express purpose of protecting imperiled plant species in their natural habitats. We aim to see the state listed species protected in at least two locations in North Carolina. That's our minimum conservation goal for our listed species. Next, please. And oh, back one. So we have done exactly that with Venus flytraps, one of our state listed species. Uh, our two preserves for this species are Boiling Spring Lakes Plant Conservation Preserve and the Hog Branch Ponds Preserve. They're both in Brunswick County, highlighted here on the map. You can see we cover the entire state, but for today, I'm just gonna focus in on flytrap country. Next, please. So these sites are adjacent to one another and are basically treated as one preserve, although they're technically two. On the map here, the preserve land is shown in light blue. I know it's quite faint, but um, it says pale blue, kind of patchy distribution of protected parcels is the uh, Boiling Spring Lakes Preserve with the Hog Branch Ponds Preserve in the far northeast corner. It's a bit of an add on there. The green outlines are management units, which include both protected and unprotected land drawn by the Plant Conservation Program and our partners for planning purposes. So in some cases, these are um, you know, just demonstrating an entire area that may, you know, see future uh, protection in the future uh, or may not, but recognizing that these are potential management units, even if it might require partnership between the state, in this case, the Plant Conservation Program and other landowners within those units. 
Although these are only two of our 26 preserves, the Boiling Spring Lakes and Hog Branch Ponds preserves contain approximately half of all the acres within the Plant Conservation Network. So Tara, if you'll quickly flip back to that last screen and just think about it this way, all the rest of those little dots are half of what we own and manage. And then just right here in this circle, forward please, is the other half. So we have quite a lot that keeps us busy out here. We are using prescribed fire as our primary management tool at these preserves. The plant conservation program has a very small field staff. And although we participate in prescribed burns, um, our entire field staff does, we rely on support from the North Carolina Forest Service and the Nature Conservancy to accomplish our burning objectives. So how did we pick this site for acquisition and why, you might be asking. Next, please. Well, one cannot overstate the charisma of the Venus flytrap. I know Johnny Randall uh, and Laura Hammond last week gave you a bunch of you know, details and um, interesting biology and ecology factoids about these species. So I'm not going to go through all of those. I'm gonna jump forward and um, mention that centering the localized conservation around this particular species as a flagship species for all of its reasons that make it so important, really helps bring important resources to the protection of a whole suite of species occupying the same habitats. Since at least the 1950s, researchers looking at the range distribution of Venus flytrap have noted reductions in populations, especially in the periphery of the range in, and in the intercoastal plain of North Carolina. In the 1980s, the Plant Conservation Program conducted a status survey, much like what Laura was presenting that she's been working on in the last couple of years. Anyway, that 1980 status survey again reported losses following up on the 1950s uh, surveys. And they emphasized that sites with extirpated populations or locally extinct populations would likely not recover. And that was due to total land conversion, those sites, typically meaning development. This included cities, um, you know, expanding um, their developed footprint, also beach resorts and the roads related to these projects. But habitat degradation is also a common problem, including high intensity silviculture and woody encroachment due to fire suppression. So there's complete habitat destruction, but then also just enough habitat degradation to also put a lot of strain and stress on this species. Interestingly, additional surveys have regularly turned up new populations as well, but these discoveries have not outpaced losses. The overall trend remains downward, suggesting that without purposeful conservation efforts, the species is still at some risk of becoming extinct in the long term. Next, please. In a follow-up survey in the 1990s, the Plant Conservation Program reported that greater than 50% of all the extant populations of Venus flytrap were located on just six large protected tracks. Now, it's wonderful that they were large and protected, but it was putting a lot of eggs in a few baskets. Importantly, the Boiling Spring Lakes um, area that is now preserved was identified as a priority location for protection and with the significant help from the Nature Conservancy and financial support from the North Carolina Natural Heritage Trust Fund, nearly 6,000 acres have been protected as the Boiling Spring Lakes Plant Conservation Preserve and the adjacent 500-ish acre hog branch ponds preserve that I showed you on the map a moment ago. So that's how we chose this particular area. Next, please. So earlier I mentioned that the Plant Conservation Program seeks to provide protection for imperiled plants in their natural habitats, but we're further interested in protecting the diversity of habitats that species like flytraps call home. I have just a few photos to highlight some of the variety of the habitats that, uh, where we find flytraps. So here's one example of a site with generally sparse vegetation on very fine, well-drained, exposed sandy soil. Next, please. In contrast, here's the edge of an inundated stream where organic soils have accumulated with tussocks of plants scattered throughout. This is perennially flooded this way um, and you never see the exposed sand um, at this site or soil for that matter. You can hopefully see the flowering fly traps in the foreground with pitcher plants in the background. Next, please. A third, but not final, example is an intermediately wet location with extremely dense wiregrass and other savanna species. 
we're really excited to hear the results from the genetic analysis study that Johnny Randall with the North Carolina Botanical Garden talked about last week to help us further identify the genetic diversity among flytrap populations. We hope that this new information will help us understand how successful we've been and not just we, the plant conservation program, but the greater we, all the conservation partners working to try and keep this plant on the landscape, how successful we've been at protecting the species across the various measures of diversity. Next, please. Yes, thank you. I know last week you heard that two of the greatest threats to fly traps are fire suppression and altered hydrology. This is true across the species range, and knowing this helps us focus our management objectives to mitigate or avoid these concerns within the protected lands. So obviously for fire, we are reintroducing and maintaining prescribed fire. Next, please. But some of the concerns and issues we have with that um, management objective is residential development and busy roads that make safe prescribed burning difficult, primarily due to smoke management. I took this image from a helicopter during a 500 acre burn at Boiling Spring Lakes Preserve. As you can see in the foreground, or I hope you can make out in the foreground, uh, that even these large acre burns have someone living near them. I also want to talk a bit about efficiency as a complicating variable when trying to um, manage with fire. There are a lot of competing needs when it comes to prescribed burning in North Carolina. Fly traps and longleaf pine are poster children for the benefits of burning, but fire suppression is the second largest threat to the native flora across North Carolina, suggesting we need a lot more fires if we're going to be able to offset this common threat. This pushes us to think bigger with our burns, but also when burning, it's generally true that nearly the same amount of work or effort is needed for a five acre burn as a 50 acre burn or possibly even a hundred acre burn. This means it pays to go larger when we can to reduce the total number of burn days we need to squeeze out of the calendar year. However, the larger the area to be burned, the more likely smoke will negatively impact someone or something in the nearby vicinity. So it's all about balance, grit, and strategy. Next, please. Add to this a constraint imposed by the natural communities we're working in. So many of the shrubs present in the pine flatwoods and pocosins, which grow near and among fly traps, are extremely flammable, especially in the early growing season. So during the spring, say March through May, burning bans are common. And even without a full burning ban, the North Carolina Forest Service will shut down prescribed burning in this area because of the risk of overly intense fire behavior. And that's just due to the biology of those shrubs, essentially, um, where instead of trying to burn, you know, what you think of as general, you know, native vegetation, it's like burning gasoline. They just are differently highly flammable during that early growing season which we have to factor into what we're trying to do and really how we're trying to um, you know, meet the objectives that we've set for ourselves. So related to this, it's increasingly common that during wildfire season out west, a great number of our burners are dispatched to help suppress wildfires, making the remaining resources really thin on the landscape. And so this not only reduces the number of available burners, it also puts strain on the North Carolina Forest Service who need to retain a crew on standby to respond to wildfires locally. Anyway, all of this is to say logistics can make things very complicated and I'm not even talking about the weather yet. You've heard enough about that, I imagine, from other presentations about fire. It's all weather dependent. Next, please. So spoke a bit about fire there. As for hydrology, some ditches and artificial drains can be removed and rehabilitated, but not all. It stands to reason too that many of the difficult to repair issues are probably the ones causing the greatest harm. So we might be able to pick away at the edges, but we might really struggle to make the, um, the bigger impacts that we're looking for. In general though, we are working to add no new ditches as a first goal and to repair and remove those that we can. Next, please. Related to this is one of our biggest concerns, fire breaks in ecotones. So Venus flytraps are particularly fond of the transition zones between the higher and drier savannas and the wet, muckier pocosins. This is a bit of an oversimplification, but it is true at the same time. Burning the pocosins 
in the lower wetter areas is a concern due to those uh, heavy flammable shrub fuels I was talking about a second ago, but also the potential to um, ignite uh, the organic soils underneath them in dry scenarios anyway. Typically they're waterlogged and not available to burn, but that's not always the case, especially during periods of drought, which we have seen a few of in the last decade or two. So these habitats are being negatively sorry, negatively impacted by both legacy effects of previous plow lines put right at that ecotone to um, prevent the ignition of the Picosan uh, fuels, and also to just kind of ring in a fire to stay just in those upland areas, as well as current lines like what I'm showing here uh, on the screen, which were installed in response to a wildfire to try and head it off at the pass. You can see in the image on the left, there were pitcher plants in this ecotone. There were other, um, you know, rare and sensitive species too. I just I can show you at this distance the pitcher plants, uh, some of which have been harmed directly and are not visible. Others which have been vaulted into the air, clearly impacting the hydrology of their habitat. Next, please. Mercifully, rehabilitating these lines is sometimes possible, at least to a degree, but it's always better to avoid a problem than to try and fix it after the fact. I mean, our parents taught us that and it comes to be true in just about every facet of life. Just avoiding the problem in the first place would save us all a lot of headache and we'd probably end up with better results. So here's a photo of the same location as I showed in the previous slide uh, after our staff have expertly patched up those hideous plow lines. Next please. And then lastly, we are not immune to poaching threats uh, with Venus flytraps on the state property. Although our preserve is large and there are fly traps in many locations, some or many of these populations are quite small and suffer greatly from these losses. We've seen the removal of both whole plants and seeds. Whole plant removal is probably obvious for being destructive to a population, especially a small one, but seed removal might be less obvious. But in, you know, at its core, when done repeatedly, um, this action of removing the seeds year after year can begin to limit the population's ability to replace itself, for one, but also it leads to a loss of genetic diversity if fewer and fewer individuals are represented in new generations of recruits. Uh, the good news stories from this problem have come from our relationship with local law enforcement. We occasionally hear from them when they confiscate fly traps um, that they find for whatever reason, and we've been able to work with the North Carolina Botanical Garden in several cases to nurse those plants back to health and then return them to a hidden location within the preserve. The bottom photo on this slide shows Venus flytraps in some uh, in potted up in, in some nursery uh, pots there from exactly one of those types of projects. Next, please. So all in all, the story I'm trying to tell is that it takes a lot of collaborations to make the management of these lands possible. Our program is primarily federally funded and we do earmark a good portion of our budget to the management of the site. However, next please. The success we've achieved would not be possible without the support from the North Carolina Forest Service and the Nature Conservancy, especially in conducting prescribed burns. Next. We have also partnered with the North Carolina Natural Heritage Program, who has helped us with species and natural community monitoring and surveys. Uh, I know last week you heard from Laura Heyman, who has conducted not only Venus flytrap surveys on our lands and others, but also surveys for the Venus flytrap cutworm moth, which is even rarer and dependent upon flytraps for its life cycle. Having these extra folks available to us to learn more about what's happening at these properties is really critical, especially for a small program. Next, please. We also receive support from the Friends of Plant Conservation, a nonprofit organization which is dedicated to supporting the North Carolina Plant Conservation Program. They are key partners for us in several arenas, but especially in public outreach and education. They help us lead tours on the plant conservation preserves, which are uh, not open to the public for general uh, use. They require a permit or a guided tour um, to access. And these tours that they're able to provide, um, you know, help us bring the public out to these sites where they can see in person how active land management is benefiting imperiled species like Venus flytraps and the special places they call home. I also mentioned just a few slides ago that we work with the North Carolina Botanical Garden too. They are a key partner to our program at this site and others. And it's true to say that these are not all of our partners, but this gives you an idea of how we go about the management of these state lands. 
Next, please. And I'll wrap it up there with a small plug. Uh, we have an upcoming field trip scheduled to visit the Boiling Spring Lakes Plant Conservation Preserve, as well as the Nature Conservancy's Green Swamp, which is just down the road. That's going to be on June 5th. This event is co-hosted by the North Carolina Botanical Garden and the Friends of Plant Conservation. Julie Moore will be one of our three tour guides. Um, you can hear her talk more about fly traps there on site. Uh, we've timed this trip to coincide with fly trap flowering season, but we're sure to see much more. So if you want more information about that or want to register to join us, I've included the link here, but you can also easily um, Google that information from the North Carolina Botanical Gardens website under their events. And with that, I'll, I'll I guess, wait for questions at the end. Great. Great. Thank, you, Thank so you so much, much. Leslie. Um, and I think you're muted, Julie. Yep, there you go. <laughs> yeah. Took me a minute. Well, that was a great overview of a significant project that goes on in the state. And many of you all may not be familiar with the plant conservation program, but with the 26 preserves across the state, I suggest that you get familiar with the program. It's one that uh, I serve on the advisory board for, and I'm very proud of what goes on with that. Uh, that what can be done with a limited staff and a whole lot of land across the landscape. It's particularly challenging. I wanted to mention, uh, you all may go thinking about the first slide, Boiling Springs Lake, which is really a, an intensive residential community that makes the whole thing a little bit more difficult. Uh, and on a field trip, we'll take a look at that. So that's a, a compounding factor. And I'll make a plug now. We all need to be supporters of burning on our landscape for multiple species. And uh, we're doing so much better in North Carolina than we used to 30 or 40 years ago. But we do have to keep working with the public to make them understand that it's a necessary management tool, not an optional one. And that when they see smoke, don't don't panic if you see smoke. Uh, find out what it's about first. Are we well connected with Andy now, do you think, uh, Tara? How's that working? We are well connected with him. Um, Andy, if you'd like to unmute yourself. You can press the, the microphone button in the top right hand corner or the bottom right hand corner of your screen. We do have Andy on the line, so hopefully we're able to hear from him. I know his connection was being a little bit tricky. Well, let me go ahead and introduce him. Andy Wood is a biologist who works both with plants and animals and all kinds of things in the coastal plain of North Carolina. He also uh, is a a landowner who has fly traps on his property. His organization is called the Coastal Plain Conservation Group. He wears that hat. He wears a private landowner hat. And he has uh, been involved for many years in all sorts of efforts along the coastal area. But when the inventory was done um, last year, he timed up as one of the major private landowners who's going to talk to us today about the Many of the things that uh, Leslie talked about, about the difficulty of burning, and as a private landowner, what the challenges are that he faces in getting burning done on his property. Is that going to work for you, Andy? Well, I hope so. If hopefully you can hear me. I am having some difficulty because I'm in the middle of Bender County, uh, down in southeastern North Carolina with limited internet access. Um, and I'm not sure that I'll be able to even share my PowerPoint. Okay, if you just want to share share with us um, without your slides, that is that is perfectly fine too. We can mostly hear you. It's cutting cutting in and out a little bit, but if it if it gets like yeah. really bad, then I'll I'll let you know, Andy. <laughs> So what I'll do is uh, show my PowerPoint to myself so I can follow along and not get um, too far off a field. Um, and so you want me to just jump into it? I'm, I'm assuming you didn't get a copy of mine, Tara. I did not get a copy. Um, I, I did not get a copy, Andy. If you do want to try to share your, your, your slides, though, um, there you can click the share content the open tray and that that should that should hopefully work unless the the internet is is really not cooperating right now i don't think it is okay 
Okay, yeah, I and I still have not received your slides through email, so that the, the internet must be pretty pretty slow. Um, but um, yeah, if you want to get, get get started with that, Andy, that that'd be great. You can just talk to okay. us. Okay, so I appreciate everybody being here, and thank you for inviting me to try to share a program with you. Um, specifically, what I wanted to talk about is the uh, integral role that uh, private landowners play with um, species conservation, habitat conservation. Um, we are, as Leslie mentioned, and also um, Johnny Randall in the previous program talked about the genetic diversity of fly traps. We're just getting into that. And when you think about private lands, they are serving as corridor habitats, connecting these larger public trust properties. And even though some of the properties like, Green, excuse me, Green Swamp and uh, Holly Shelter Game Land here in Pender County, uh, they may be large tracts of land, but they are essentially landlocked by other activities, whether it's construction of our built environments or agriculture or monoculture uh, timber operations. So having private landowners engaged in fly trap conservation is going to help maintain those corridors for genetic diversity and not just for fly traps, but for all of the other species that um, Leslie alluded to, pitcher plants included, but also wildlife species. Um, we're talking, of course, about longleaf pine habitat, which is in short supply today compared to uh, just 100 years ago or so when there were 93 million acres of longleaf covering the southeastern U.S. and we're now down to less than 3 million. And of that 3 million, we could probably count hundreds of thousands of acres of really high quality longleaf habitat. The remaining acreage is of varying degrees of quality. Um, so when we're talking about fly trap, and again, I'm repeating a little bit of what Leslie talked about, we're talking about very distinct ecosystems found nowhere else in the world specifically, and, and my experience is primary with fly traps is here in uh, Pender and New Hanover County, a little bit in Brunswick as well. But in Pender and New Hanover County, we've lost, well, in New Hanover, we've lost probably close to 80 or 90% of the longleaf pine habitat, uh, the best longleaf pine habitat. Uh, there is still longleaf up in the northeast part of the county over toward the Northeast Cape Fear River in an area also called um, uh, that the Natural Heritage Program is working with uh, on what we call the Sidbury area, which again is transition area between Northeast New Hanover and Southwest Pender counties. Um, it's a narrow band of mostly wet pine flat, which is the ideal situation for uh, Venus flytrap, along with orchids, pitcher plants, sundew, uh, coolies meadow root, which is an endangered species, um, federally endangered, another federally endangered species in the area we're looking for right now on private land, including um, is uh, golden uh, sedge along with um, roughleaf loosestrife. And uh, these are plants that are found on private land that is maybe not well understood by the private land owner. And that's one of the challenges for uh, private landowner involvement. They don't know what's required to maintain fly traps along with the guild of other plants and wildlife that inhabit the same environment. So my role as a, what I call myself as a community conservationist, I work with land trusts and private landowners to help them manage property 
um, to the benefit of not just fly traps, but whatever other plants and animals may live with fly traps on those properties. The primary threat to fly traps, as I'm sure everybody on the call knows, is habitat conversion, either to constructed environment uh, developments or uh, two other things that forestry gets a, um, a lot of grief for, in some cases, for good reason. Uh, but one thing that's commonly overlooked is pine straw harvesting for the landscape industry. Longleaf pine is a highly coveted, produces a highly coveted uh, pine straw for landscaping. Practice is pretty hard on the land. Um, Wiregrass is not appreciated by those who have to break the pine straw. And so what we're finding is diminishment of biodiversity in areas that are uh, heavily raked for uh, pine straw each year with, with every uh, straw drop. Um, they go in and rake everything off of the ground. And so what we're seeing is a slow degradation from once richly biodiverse habitat to pretty much longleaf pine trees, bare soil, and straw. Um, so that's an issue that we're going to have to address, including with the private landowners, which have the uh, unappreciated, they play the unappreciated role of providing public trust service by keeping their land in living standing trees. Uh, those public trust benefits include air and water filtration, uh, stormwater storage, and uh, a couple of things that benefit all people, uh, including green carbon storage and blue carbon storage. And those are a term that refer to uh, the green carbon storage is in living trees. The blue carbon storage is in the soil. And again, you could see with Leslie's images that uh, the soil in this area here in southeastern North Carolina, many of our areas, the soil is black. It's just organic material. Uh, sodasols and um, heavy organic soil, carbon rich soil. And so by protecting the standing trees and the soil, we are sequestering carbon, which is one of the most important things we can do right now in uh, trying to combat climate change, or at least the rate of climate change. So cutting trees right now, uh, is not in the best you need trees for a, a variety of things, but if there's opportunity to compensate private landowners for protecting living standing trees and the soil that support those trees, um, that is a public trust service that benefits everybody. And one of the things that I'm trying to find along with Julie are economic opportunities for these landowners to help compensate them for the cost of uh, maintaining this land in its natural state. One of the, the biggest challenges for landowners of uh, large tracts of land is related to equipment. Uh, we talk a lot about uh, fire as a valuable tool, and yet when we burn habitat, we release carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. I get that. but we're trying to do two, well, we're trying to do multiple things with private land management, protecting biodiversity uh, while also combating climate change. And um, there's some give and take in that arena. But one of the big expenses to private landowners is simple equipment. Having a tractor to cut fire breaks, for example, using simple discs, which is what um, primarily I recommend using rather than a V-trench ditch, which impedes things like box turtles, chicken turtles, and spotted turtles from moving easily across the landscape. So we disc um, around 
areas to hopefully prevent spot over fires. Many of the landowners have a tractor and a disc so they can provide that service on their own. Um, but we also need to be able to move water. And when you're moving 250 gallons of water, you're moving um, several hundred pounds. And that requires, uh, if not a small truck, some kind of a heavy duty buggy to move that water around as a safety feature and a safety tool. So right there, just with those two pieces of equipment, you're looking at well over $100,000 just for a tractor, disc, a buggy, and water and pump system. So there's a serious investment right there on the private landowner. Um, and then in addition to that, you have to have the fire igniting equipment, which is a minimal cost, a drip torch, basically. And you can burn a whole bunch of land for um, $100 or so uh, if you have that other backup equipment that I mentioned, the tractor and buggy. And um, there are programs available for a stewardship programs. There's the Longleaf Alliance, which is uh, helping raise grants. Um, the USDA and Wildlife Resources Commission in the state can help with programs like EQUIP and uh, CURE and other land management practices that benefit habitat to the benefit of wildlife. And when we're talking about longleaf pine habitat, no discussion is complete in southeastern North Carolina without some mention of the red cockaded woodpecker. But we also have Carolina gopher frogs. And while you can burn any time of the year in, in uh, red cockaded woodpecker habitat, for the most part, um, burning in Carolina gopher frog habitat is problematic because these animals migrate across pretty large distances and they migrate during February and March, maybe early April. And that's the prime time for burning because as Leslie mentioned during the spring when we would really rather burn, uh, we have staff shortages plus the inkberry, cerilla and other evergreen shrubs that we're trying to eliminate or at least reduce, they are rich with oils, volatile oils that increase the risk of wildfire. So there's any number of conundrums. I can talk all day about the, the, the challenges we face on private lands, trying to do one thing and another with limited budgets and um, the good news is the state agencies and federal agencies that are involved in longleaf pine management, they're willing to help as they can. They'll provide professional guidance and when possible, uh, they'll even throw in crews to help with such things as chasing grants to pay for the equipment needed um, for cutting fire breaks and maybe even paying a professional burner to come in and, and do the burn for the landowner who may not have the necessary insurance um, is a very costly thing when fire escapes from where you are trying to burn. And so insurance or lack thereof is an impediment to some of our private landowners as well. And many of these private landowners, they're not subsistence living, but um, they're farmers or they're, they're foresters and they just don't have the, the ready available resources to acquire the equipment to and even the time to chase the grants. Um, so in addition to red cockaded woodpecker, there are turkey, quail and dove, deer, uh, other game species that provide again, public trust benefit in that um, there are revenues generated through Pittman bulls and other um, acts that generate their basically excise taxes on uh, such things as firearms and ammunition. Um, that goes into a fund to help with land management 
not so much with private lands as with public lands, but that's something we're working on as well, trying to make public monies available for private landowners whose properties are providing public trust benefit. If that makes sense. Um, and I have gone through my slides, and it might be better uh, if I'm not over time to open it up for questions to Leslie and myself or any any of the others, uh, including Julie. Thank you, Andy. That gave a really good overview of the responsibilities and cost of private landowners. And I do suggest people investigate uh, what programs are available. Uh, I'm just signed a contract yesterday for my a family property in Texas, Pine Timber, to uh, do some burning. And I can't be there to do it. And I have to rely on a uh, consultant to do the burning for me. It is uh, it is an investment we're making. And I, one of the things we want to do for this landowner uh, program, Venus Flytrap Champions, is to try to help landowners get connected to sources of funds. And in time, if this program is successful, uh, maybe we'll be able to actually get some larger grants to uh, people can draw on funds to get the burning done and other work for these plants. As you said, Andy, I'd like to say the connections that you mentioned that these private lands make between public lands is another important aspect of the bigger picture of um, fly traps and longleaf conservation. At that, um, Tara, let's open it up for questions. You handle those so well, if you will. Oh, Leslie has something. I think that Leslie has a question. Yep. Or a yeah, statement. it's not a question. Um, but what Andy was ending with there, I wanted to tack on real quick. Um, so it's not a done deal, and it's still you know coming down the pike. But there's a pretty good chance that North Carolina could start receiving a humongous increase in um, in funding for um, in the broad scheme wildlife management, um, and that's through the Pittman Robinson uh, you know act that he was talking about earlier. And it's um, you know put in perspective, there's you know currently about like one to two million dollars that the North Carolina, um, you know, well, that the Wildlife Resources Commission through the State Wildlife Action Plan and and funds related to that um, receive on an annual basis. If this new um, bill passes the Senate this year, it's already passed the House, if it comes in through the Senate, um, then that would increase North Carolina's wildlife revenues to like 26 million. So we're not talking about chump change. It's huge. It, it stands to be a really big increase. Um, currently, those funds can only be spent on priorities identified in the state wildlife action plan, which is updated every 10 years. Uh, so the last one was in 2015. Um, anyway, the, um, the plant conservation program has been working really hard for the last year to get plants added to that plan. Currently, it only has species of greatest conservation need identified as true wildlife species, not the everything they depend on, <laughs> which we think are really important. So um, that is something we're hoping to submit as a revision to the plan in the next couple of months, which would, autumn, if approved by the Fish and Wildlife Service, um, that would include Venus flytrap and as well as all of the state listed plant species as potentially um, um, suitable for, um, for grant funds. And so this coming together that Julie's talking about of you know, bringing needs that lots of private landowners share into one you know, larger organization or something like that could make the opportunities for drawing down those funds um, in the future, I hope a real, um, a real possibility. Thank you for that update, Leslie. It's important to know what's going on and where there are funds available and how we're going to look after both public and private lands here in North Carolina. And that those are funds that hopefully will come through and we can tap onto. Great, thank you. And if anyone has any questions for any of our three panelists, um, Feel free to, yep, uh, we have a question from Claire and Leslie, if you'd like to unmute yourself. There you are. So when you are doing burning, how do you take care of like all the squirrel nests and the bird nests to make sure you're not burning squirrels and birds and eggs? 
Andy, do you want to take that or do you want me to go? Uh, I can jump on that. That's an excellent question. And um, let me assure you, uh, Leslie and I are fraught with guilt every time we set a fire. We know we're harming things unintentionally. Um, fire is a natural part of the habitat that we are burning. And what we try to do is work around the schedule of when fire would naturally occur in those habitats. That's why I mentioned before about the gopher frog. Um, I will not burn in an area where I know gopher frogs and have gopher frogs, by the way, are a critically imperiled frog, one of the most one of the world's rarest amphibians, one of the world's rarest animals. We know there are only a handful of populations left. We know where those populations are. We know generally where the frogs are moving to and from. And so we schedule our burns around the time when the frogs are moving as best we can. Many of the burns we do are before breeding season. And if we know that there's an area where a particularly rare bird is breeding, like red cockaded woodpecker, we prepare the site around that woodpecker's tree. They have a, a cabin tree that they maintain year round. So before we do a burn, we'll go in um, with string mowers or blower. But with the string mower, we mow around that tree, usually about to the width of the canopy, which might be five to 30 feet. So we give the tree a wide berth. And that way, when we do the burn over the surrounding habitat, that particular cavity tree, that family of woodpeckers, uh, is protected from a greater risk of the canopy catching on fire or the, even the bark catching on fire. In terms of the shrubby undergrowth, um, we're burning in early, early spring, typically, or in winter, and birds aren't nesting at that time. Um, in winter, when we're burning, box turtles, spotted turtles, snakes, lizards, they're hunkered down in the ground, they're under logs. Um, in the summer, these habitats, again, are adapted to fire, or the plants are adapted to fire. And to a degree, so are many of the animals that live there. Obviously, a turtle can't outrun a fast-moving fire. They hunker down in their shell. And it is surprising to me, every time we conduct a burn, I'll go back and, and do a follow-up survey that day. Um, and I'll find, turning over logs, you'll, you'll roll over even a piece of bark, just a piece of thin, half-inch thick bark. You'll lift that up. And lo and behold, there's a cricket under there, or a spider, or a, a lizard, or a toad. Um, that's enough protection for them sometimes, depending on the fuel load. But to be honest, when we do these burns, some animals perish. I, I can't sugarcoat it. That's, that's just unfortunate. The other thing that we do to try and minimize how many you know, uh, critters might be negatively impacted is the techniques the day of. So we'll make sure that we give an escape route. So when we start a fire, we start in one location and work toward the other side instead of going all the way around so that they can't get away without crossing the flames. We also consider um, if an entire uh, habitat type can be um, split into multiple burn units so that we're not burning the entire habitat that those critters you know, live in at one time. And we'll break it up, say this year we'll burn this half and this year we'll burn, or next year we'll burn this half. So that they have a piece of refuge to go back to when the fire is done that not every scrap of you know, shrub cover that they wanted to live under has burnt that single day. That was a good question, and that was a lot of good answers from you all. And I think the main thing we have to remember is that all of these uh, natural systems evolve with fire, and so that fires were a part of the landscape before human beings were even here. So it's tricky, but you've heard the techniques that they're using, and I, I hope you won't get upset about fire when you think about the good that it does too. Looks and like it's definitely true that most animals that I see on a burn are escaping. It's actually 
a very, very small number that um, can't make it out. They have incredible uh, ability to hunker down and wait it out or to flee. Do we have another question in the box? We do not have another question yet. Um, so if anyone would like to put their questions in the chat box, you can put them in the chat or you can raise your hand. Um, either way works. We do have some great um, comments in in the chat, though. And would it be possible to include both of your 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 slide decks in the um, follow up email to folks so that they'd be able to take a look closely at your slides? Um, we did have someone ask ask about that, so we can we can try to include that if that's if that's all right with you guys. Um, and mm -hmm. let's thank you. Um, and let's see, do we have any more questions here? Thank you. Um, Chuck posted the Venus Flytrap Champions website, which looks amazing. It's a new, new, new website that they got up and running. We'll give everyone just a few seconds in case anyone has some cool pending questions. That was a great first question, something that was in my mind as well. So thank you, Claire, I believe. One of the things we've included on the website is where to go see Venus flytraps, both in the wild and uh, in captivity. And uh, the Botanical Garden, uh, Johnny Randall's, I noticed on the call, uh, that's here in Chapel Hill area, Triangle, but also in Wilmington. Uh, we have areas, um, Carolina Beach State Park, and right in town, um, there is a reader garden that has all kinds of insectivorous plants. And the Nature Conservancy has their very uh, uh, well-managed uh, green swamp property that we're going to have the field trip to. So there are places where you can get out and see fly traps, and it's one of the coolest things in the world to see them when they're in flower and to see them when they're in action too. So I encourage you all to get out and see them if you can, and of course you can try to grow them, but I must admit I've been very unsuccessful with that myself. Um, let me, should we go ahead and finish up or do we have one um, more? John, Sean Jacob has a question, if you just want to unmute yourself. Yes, I was wondering if it's possible to uh, effectively move some Venus tri uh, tri traps to other areas. Like I live in the Charlotte area and wondered if, you know, we could start a garden of them successfully here. Well, so, I'll tell you that. want me to take that? Uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll start. Um, so there's, um, you know, lots of folks do, you know, garden in their home garden with this species. Uh, that's, you know, a fun activity. You can learn a lot about a plant by studying it every day. But in turn, but if your question is more about, um, you know, public display for education purposes, or are you t thinking more in like a naturalized uh, location, something, you know, just to have a, a safeguarded spot. I, I wanted to ask you that follow up. Uh, I was thinking more as a safeguarded spot. <laughs> so our program, the Plant Conservation Program, um, regulates the the movement of imperiled species to non uh, to non garden environments. Activities like that would require a permit because we find it really important to keep plants within their you know, natural habitats for all kinds of ecological reasons, but also to keep them connected with the other populations. Um, we have lots and lots and lots of protected land for the species. There are some species out there that are worse off than flytraps that have lost all or most of their natural habitats and safeguarding in additional or off-site locations is just all we have left. But we're just not there with flytraps, thank goodness, because so many partners have been working for decades to protect the natural landscapes that they are a part of. And it's a pretty wide range too. Um, I know Johnny and Laura showed a bunch of maps about that last week. So I would um, say that moving them far out of their range into an area like say Charlotte wouldn't um, be in the top tier of a, the conservation goals for a species like flytraps. We'd like to you know, keep all of us going toward the goals that we've already set that we think we need a lot more work on. Good answer. Okay. And, and the key there is, go ahead. Go ahead, 
Go ahead, Amy. Uh, the key is protecting existing habitat, which is in, it's not the fly trap, it's the habitat the fly trap inhabits. And we've lost uh, the, the vast majority of fly trap habitat in New Hanover County, which was once the epicenter of biological diversity on the entire Atlantic seaboard, stretching from Florida to the Gulf of Maine. And New Hanover County was the epicenter of biodiversity, and much of it is now gone. It's been paved over. So the fly trap's not going extinct. It's established in Australia. It's in Hawaii. It's in New Jersey. It's all kind of all around the world, South Africa. You can find gardens of fly traps. It's almost an invasive species in some places. But the key is we're trying to protect the fly trap in its what's called natal in its natural habitat here in southeastern North Carolina. It's great that it's alive in Florida, but the habitat in southeastern North Carolina is what's really, really critical. Not just for the fly trap, for all of the other plants and wildlife. Great, and we have a question from Johnny Randall, if you'd like to unmute yourself and then we can finish up our chat today. Okay, can you hear me? We can hear you. Uh, so I put this in the chat that um, well, one of the things I talked about last week in my talk was um, our seed bank at the North Carolina Botanical Garden where we have um, uh, seeds from probably I think six, 60 different populations in the state. Um, and that is the most efficient and effective way of conserving fly traps off-site um, that, that seed can be used for reintroduction and uh, research, but um, it's, it's much simpler to do that than to try and create Venus flytrap habitat outside of its natural range. Thanks, Johnny for finishing that concept up. I think it's time for us to, to close out, but I'd like to encourage all of you all who uh, had no landowners who might have fly traps to let us know. I mentioned supporting burning no matter where it happens. Uh, someone added the, the new website that we have, Venus Flytrap Champions. We'll be posting more information there about management needs, but also we even have a fun page that uh, Leslie might like to look at. Uh, on that uh, website and anything you'd like to contribute. Last week we heard from someone and got a wonderful news article about uh, brothers in Wilmington and all they've done for fly traps in the past. You can also uh, contribute in different ways. Here we have the North Carolina Wildlife Federation sponsoring uh, this set of webinars. The Nature Conservancy's help with the brochure. Someone else is going to be uh, doing a video for burning. If your organization or as individuals you would like to contribute, come up with an idea. We'd love to entertain it. And we also have a place you can contribute a little bit of funding to this project as we go forward. You can see it's a dynamic and interesting issue that relates in many ways to the bigger picture of conservation along the Eastern seaboard, particularly in the Carolinas. I'd like to thank you all for joining us today. And Tara, thank you for making this all work. You've done a great job and uh, the, these will be posted so you can get to listen again if you want to or listen to the whole series at one time. I think. Thank you all so much. Yeah, and please, please join us next week, um, Wednesday at 12 p.m. for the third of the Venus Flytrap series, the third and the last. So we hope to see you there. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Tara. Thank you. Thank you, Tara. Thanks, guys.